Hello, my name is Don O'Boyle, and I will be your host today. Welcome to another segment of the Oral History Project of the Village, Advise Village History Advisory Board. The goal of this program is to invite residents of Ross's Point to share with us their recollections and memories of our village many years ago. I'm sure that in this segment, we'll hear many interesting things about our village. Today, we're going to share some of our, share our time with Mr. Leo Laterna. Welcome, Leo. Thank you. Uh, Leo is right at this time is a supervisor of the town of Champlain. He's also a state certified uh, instructor for the EMT program. It's, it's, and he's also cert certified by the American Red Cross. Uh, he is a very busy person. He's a captain of the Ross's Point Rescue Squad. He's a chaplain of the American Legion, post 912, and also a chaplain of the uh, Ross's Point Fire Department. So Leo, you're quite a busy person, aren't you? And by the way, uh, in 1970, he was also a town justice and councilman from 1960 to 1976. So you've been a very busy person for the community, haven't you, Leo? I've been involved, that's for sure. I was mayor of the village for uh, 12 years, and uh, I've kept myself quite busy, um, both in village government and town government, and also involved in the Clinton County Supervisors Association and uh, the Clinton County uh, Magistrates Association. Those telephones ringing all the time at your house. I know because I visit Leo's home a lot. Uh, how long have you lived in Rosses Point? Oh, my life, but well, with the exception of my time in the service, and then I, I lived in the Oranges for perhaps uh, ten years, and I also lived in South Jersey uh, for probably seven years. Well, you still call Ross's Point home, though, don't you? I couldn't wait to get back. <laughs> Where was your first home in, in Ross's Point? Do you remember? Uh, well, our first home was in uh, Dr. Letourneau's home, which my grandfather, that was on the corner of Pratt and Lake Street. The house is still there. Mm -hmm. And uh, the doctor had uh, his office, waiting room, and his uh, living quarters on one side of the house. And uh, we lived on the other side of the house. Did your mother do the usual things at that time, like preserve her own food and make her own clothing, things That's of that right. type? That's right. She made, you know, she made bread and uh, the regular clothing that we had, most of us, we had one store-bought outfit and the rest was homemade. Mm -hmm. By the way, how did, you, how did you get to school at that time? Did you? Oh, we walked. We did. <laughs> there were no buses or airplanes or anything else. We had to walk through the snow and uh, rain or shine. We had to get to school and that's how we got there. And uh, your church activities, I know you're active in the church now. Were you active when you were younger? Well, I think I became an altar boy when I was seven years old. Uh, the only time that I sat in the congregation was uh, for my first communion and confirmation. And I think uh, the rest of the time was spent on the altar. Uh, I was sacristan for uh, Monsignor Cleary uh, while he was here. And that was preparing uh, the altar for mass and selecting the mass. Uh, for that particular day, and also uh, at that time we had uh, anapendiums that we hung in front of the altar, and uh, you know whatever the season was, was you know the Pentecost or Lent, we had the purple and so on and so forth, and I prepared the uh, altar for funerals and stuff like that. And then my mother was very active in the altar rosary society, and one day I saw her climbing up on top of the altar, polishing brass and decorating, and I decided that, you know, perhaps I was much younger than she was and I could do that. So I decorated the altar and polished brass for quite a few years after that. Well, you certainly were involved, <laughs> all right. What, was your, what it, was your major career in life? I know you're retired now. Well, uh, I guess it was a combination of many things. I Perhaps uh, uh, when I went to the National Youth Administration Program in Ithaca, New York, uh, I hopefully I was hoping to be able to become a, a, a doctor is, is what I would look forward to. Uh, we went to, uh, had classes at Cornell, and uh, then uh, the draft came along, so rather than wait, I decided to volunteer, and that ended up uh, being seven years, and of course that changed my whole life around. Uh, from there, I, when I came back, I, I <coughs> worked on the railroad, uh, and uh, I worked there for nine years, 11 months and 22 days. <laughs> so I didn't, I didn't quite make the pension, 10, a 10 year pension, but uh, I worked at Aris, uh, and from, uh, I worked from Aris perhaps from 
8 in the morning until 4.30 in the afternoon, showered, and then went up to the railroad and worked from 5 to 1 in the morning uh, wow. as a clerk and baggage man, so that uh, I kept quite busy in that area, too. Yes, you keep right on, don't you? <laughs> oh, if you're growing up now, you just told us that your, your profession would be lean toward being a doctor, wouldn't it? Well, that's right. Mm -hmm. I know on Pratt Street, when we have emergencies, we all go to Leo and he takes care <laughs> of us. Uh, how many grandchildren or great-grandchildren do you have? I have two. I have a granddaughter and a grandson. Mm -hmm. Of course, you remember your grandparents and your... Well, adopted. I don't remember my grandmother, Laterno, too well, but I do remember my grandfather, who was a doctor, and uh, I can remember when he died, my dad brought me into the parlor, and I remember seeing this big, long box and couldn't understand what it was. And you still remember that? He, oh, yes. He raised me up, and then we saw Grandpa, and he, he explained to me what had happened, and uh, that I wasn't to be afraid that, you know, this was going to happen to all of us, and uh, basically that's all that I really remember about mm -hmm. my granddad. Well, I happen to know, going on to our next subject, you have quite a few pictures of early Ross's Point, and I'm sure that everyone would be very glad to see them. So. Uh, you're starting off with your our first in institutions. You have pictures of our church. First one is this is St. Patrick's Church, which was up on Church Street, and which is now uh, the remains of the uh, wall are still there. And this is where our our uh, local priests are buried. So this uh, this year, of course, is. Uh, St. Patrick's Church at the present, not really at the present time, you notice the rectory has the porch all the way around, and of course there's been many changes made since then. And the Cluffy Saborn house to the uh, left there, uh, of course, has been changed as closed porch, so on and so forth. Then we have St. Patrick's School and Convent. The school took up two floors, and the nuns lived up on the top floor. And uh, many, many times uh, I had to go and climb up to the belfry and uh, put the bell rope back onto the, what's it called? They rang the bell for not only for school, but the Angelus in the morning, noon, and at night. Uh, so, uh, and on a windy day, I assure you, the St. Patrick's used to rock back and forth. A little scary at times. This was the Episcopal Church. Uh, which is no longer there now. It was, uh, I believe the uh, land was purchased by the M.B. Clark Funeral Home and the uh, church was uh, taken down. This is another view of the church. Uh, right here, this is the old post office building. And if, if you will notice there, uh, there were barges all along there The where <laughs> Mr. Uh, West his home is today, that was the old fire station, and, and uh, there was a, a canal. The water came right up to the uh, street uh, edge there, and of course the fire station was where the annex is onto the, uh, the municipal building now. This here is a picture of the interior of the uh, uh, Ross's Point Post Office. This is another picture of the interior of the Ross's Point Post Office. This scene here uh, was very familiar to all of us. Uh, this was during Prohibition. And uh, here, uh, this is right in front of St. Patrick's Church between what is Gaines Garage now and our water plant in the village. And the water came almost up to the road at that time. And what they would do, they would take uh, all of this booze and beer, uh, all advertisements, Canadian advertisements for different uh, uh, booze and, and, and what they did, they threw this all out in the lake and they would break the bottles. But every now and then you would see a bottle shoot out in the lake and then early <laughs> later that evening you'd see somebody going out with hip boots on, <laughs> uh, <laughs> resurrecting that extra bottle that he threw out there. This is a picture of the Rutland Railroad at that time. I believe it was Noe Belair, lived out on the bridge. Mr. Casper Muller worked there for many years, and of course, he'd walk back and forth onto the bridge. This is again another scene of the house on the bridge. This here is the old Windsor or Saxony Hotel, as it's known today. As you can see, there are certainly a lot of changes that happened there. <coughs> This is the Arlington House. This was on State Street. Uh, 
uh, well, in the area perhaps where uh, Dr. Sclair's house, or what we formerly was Dr. Sclair's home, uh, was there. Uh, when this burned down, uh, Steve Casabon was running this place and he served the bar. <laughs> Everybody got free drinks until they had to get out of there because of the fire. This was the fire in, I believe it was in uh, April 22nd, 1909. The Holland Hotel, portion of that Holland Hotel burned. And this is a, a picture of that particular incident. Here we have the Delaware and Hudson Railroad, which hasn't uh, changed too much from that day. Here we have, uh, the, you can see the Montgomery Hotel, which is directly across the road. Uh, the Montgomery Hotel was there, and then uh, there was a building next to that. Uh, and then the YMCA. The YMCA uh, wa ended up being Armand's place. Uh, the building next to it is where I lived. Mr. Napoleon Rasco was a uh, barber there, and he had a barber shop in the end, and we had uh, a family living upstairs at that time. This year is a scene uh, that I certainly remember very well, and I know Don does. And this was Marnes's Inn. In the back of Marnes's Inn, they had a beautiful dock. Uh, and as, as you can see, uh, perhaps in this picture, where the walkway, you went across from uh, one side to the other. We were able to swim around in this area. <coughs> now here, A.J. Miro, they had their home down in what is formerly the Pearl Store. And also, they also had a, a docking, uh, private docking there for themselves also. Here again, boats coming up to this docking area. And as you can see, you can see the post office in the uh, background. This, I don't know, what, this was Ken Campbell's house today. I, I really don't know what it was at that time. Apparently decorated for one of our parade times. Here, this is where uh, Art Spiegel lives today. We used to call it Phillips Hall. It's the same type of, of uh, stone construction that was used uh, to build the fort. This is a scene that a lot of us remember. That was the chestnut tree on the corner of Lake and uh, State Street. This was a drugstore, which is presently a uh, Chauvet's insurance agency. Again, another scene, a window scene of that. And of course, as you can see, there's very little has been changed there. The, the steps going upstairs are still there. Here's another scene <coughs> with the uh, chestnut tree. This here was Anna Laundry, Anna McDonough. She ran a dry goods store on the corner of uh, State and Lake Street, uh, which is presently now the uh, uh, Myers Company, uh, which has been completely renovated. Uh, the uh, block itself was known as the Bowern Block. John Bowern's father built that building. This year's a scene in the park. Uh, as you can see, the water fountain, I don't know whether you can see it or not, but uh, we are replacing uh, the vase. We're not getting the exact vase that was on there, but Peg Barcombe uh, uh, sought something that would perhaps uh, duplicate what was there, and we were able to do this for her. And it's my understanding that the Rouse family will be paying for this. This is another scene on the corner. Here we have what we used to know as Slingsby store. He had magazines and uh, just about everything in his store. Most of the time it was somewhat of a Collier mansion. It was pretty well cluttered up. Uh, but towards uh, the end, uh, he uh, finally straightened the store out. Next to it is the building where Angtail's restaurant is now. That used to be a bakery run by Mr. Bertrand, Morris Bertrand's dad. <coughs> This here is a scene uh, of inside our old fire station, which is now, uh, of course, a home for uh, Mr. Victor and Mr. and Mrs. Victor West. And this was the hose room downstairs, so you can see what we had for equipment in those days. This here is the old Cobb farm. It's presently owned by my nephew, William Letourneau, uh, who's done extensive renovations inside of the building. This is a old stone building. Uh, the wall's probably three feet thick all the way through. 
Uh, this is the scene on Lake Street. Uh, this is next to the drugstore. And we had Wallace and Dan and Rosemeyer had a store there, and Mr. Crook had a store where uh, New Channels is now. This is the building, I call it the uh, Dick Irving building. I, I, I believe it was his parents who lived there. That's next to the Saxony Hotel out on Lake Street. Here we have our Dodge Memorial Library. And here, this was the pumping station in Ross's Point where they used to generate their own power. This here is a tower that was on Liberty Street. And as you can see, this that building, that home is still there. That little house is still there. And uh, this is a scene when the tower was taken down. This was a village water supply at one time. Uh, I have a lot of other pictures where uh, we could perhaps uh, see where we had two butcher shops on Main Street. Uh, and over the Slingsby block, uh, we had uh, a barber shop, Filthy Viage. And you go down State Street uh, from the uh, drugstore, you would go into Mr. Hoig's uh, jewelry shop. That was Frank Hoig's dad. And uh, there was a pool room there run by Mr. Jim Thiviage, I worked after school there for a number of years. Uh, Mr. Alec Laundry was operating it and I was setting up uh, tables for uh, people to play pool. So I guess that's about it on the pictures. Well, they're very entertaining, Leo. <laughs> My next question would be, how do you think Ross's point has changed? We can see from the picture, pictures it has changed a great deal. Um, you think life makes you think life is better now from well certainly uh, I have to say that, that that life is better yes you know we, we have electricity uh, we we have television we have radio uh, a lot of things are better but uh, I would say going back to uh, say 15 years ago uh, this is when the uh, drug culture was introduced in our area and unfortunately a lot of our kids got involved and, and I think perhaps the old days were better because we didn't have this particular problem. We had prohibition and I don't think that we had uh, the kids uh, drinking perhaps the way they are today and, and hopefully it's somehow we can curb this. All right. as, as you all know, this is our oral history project and Leo Turner is telling us about many interesting things. Uh, is being older like you expect it to be? What was that? Is being older like you expect <laughs> it to be? <laughs> well. I don't know anything about being older. Uh, I think I think you know numbers are numbers, and that's all they are. I certainly am active in the rescue squad. I I, I teach constantly, first aid, CPR. I, I'm in the EMT program. Uh, I make many ambulance calls. I I have lectured uh, at the state university under the justice court program. Uh, Age? No, I don't. I don't. I, I'm not old enough yet You're to. You're just not going to be I don't be think old, that. Right, no, I don't believe. It. Not yet, anyway. Mm. No. So, um, if you could change your life differently than if, if you had it to do again, you would probably do the same thing. Wouldn't you? I, I, I believe so. I, I would find some way how somehow to <laughs> to be able to further my ambition that of being in medicine. But uh, I, I, as I said, I got involved. In my, I was a registered medical technician and. Uh, I worked in hospitals, and uh, my service career was dealt entirely with uh, with medics. I was a teacher uh, from well, right from 1940, uh, and uh, so I, I would perhaps do the same thing that I did then. Thinking about uh, about cars and things, technology. Do you remember the first car you drove? I certainly do. I was 15 years old, and I drove a 16-cylinder Cadillac. Trust and me, I, I remember all those things. I too. drove it for perhaps, uh, I don't know, six or seven years, I guess, till somebody told me I had to have a license. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I can remember going down to Plattsburgh and taking a test in a Model A Ford, which had the Spark Advance, so on and so forth. <laughs> and the first thing I did, I let up on the clutch and the car shot ahead. And I said, whoop, I put on the brakes. He says, I can't drive this thing. He said, why not? I said, it's just too fast for me. He said, what have you been driving? I said, a 16-cylinder Cadillac. So I went back the next day with the 16-cylinder Cadillac and 
passed my test with flying colors. Well, that's good. <laughs> The roads are about the same as they are now, of course, except for our oh, yes. beautiful highways, um, right? The north way. The price of gas and all that. Oh, five for a dollar. <laughs> 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 yeah, that was that was that was the nice part of it. Yeah. Thinking about things that, that have changed our lives. What do you think about television? Well, I I think I think television is absolutely fantastic. It, our, our younger people today are. I have an awareness of so many more things. Uh, their their involvement is unbelievable. Uh, with us, I think that we had to struggle uh, through school and, and uh, just wonder what was what. Homework was difficult. Uh, we didn't always have the dedicated teachers. And, and then we did have some very dedicated teachers. So all in all, uh, I, I think with the television media, uh, you're up to date on current events, world events, and it's just absolutely fantastic compared to, you know, our day as ch as children. I certainly agree with you. Uh, thinking about prohibition, this town, our town, our famous little town, has been famous for its fight prohibition problems. Can you remember any of that? Oh, Were I certainly do. <laughs> I was a youngster, and we lived right on the corner over here on Pratt and Lake. And the custom house was in the Myers building. The immigration office was up on Pratt Street. And then they came down here and they pulled along the side and then they would go and report. And I would watch them take their booze out and hide it in the gutter or what have you. And then uh, I can remember Julia Franks, that was Julia Plant. They had a store across the where Martell's trailer is now. There was a, uh, a um, they ran a store of some sort. I can't quite remember what it was. And then they would come over and say, Leo, We'll give you a quarter if you go over and pick that bottle up. And I would go pick it up and bring it across the street, unaware that I was <laughs> violating the law and everything else. And uh, many, many times I did that. Made quite a few quarters, too. I'm so busy. that was interesting. It really was. And, of course, uh, I can remember every now and then uh, the immigration and patrol coming down the street 100 miles an hour trying to uh, catch someone. And I always wondered how they did they missed Hoyt's garage because uh, f more than once we thought that somebody would go right through there but they managed to turn around at that area. My, my father's garage was between the, the customs and the immigration and in the restroom we had found quite a few pe people left things there. <laughs> when they came to return them they were always missing. Yeah. <laughs> I always wondered about that. Uh, is there anything else you'd like to talk about? Well, uh, I don't know. I, I, I you know, you, you talk about the village and what we, what we accomplished in the village. I had an excellent, excellent board, uh, and each time that you know our elections, we would get different trustees, and, and uh, everybody had a different idea. You know, the a new broom sweeps clean, so clean, so to speak. And and uh, but when they sat down and really went through what was going on, what was happening, they felt that perhaps we were doing what we were supposed to do. I know that uh, uh, we went uh, quite a few years without any taxes at all. And of course, when I came into office, this presented a problem for the simple reason that the uh, basically the village equipment and the fire department equipment plus the electrical system, we didn't have any streets or sidewalks maintenance for a number of years. So this was quite a, a challenge and we tried to be as frugal as possible without, you know, putting on a heavy tax burden, but it was really difficult at that time. Uh, I'm kind of proud of the accomplishment that our that our board had. We, we got a new fire station during that time. Uh, we changed, we got rid of our little prison, our four cells, and uh, we put in a village office there. Uh, we started the, perhaps the uh, first parade in 1960. Uh, Bill Valenzi and myself, he was my deputy mayor, uh, we, uh, decided that we would like to see a community parade once a year. A and uh, I think we allocated $200 for it. I don't, even think, we were, I don't even think we were legal doing that. <laughs> but anyway, uh, George Ducharme uh, came up to us and he had the same idea. So beautiful, we just <laughs> turned it over to George. And we have been having, as you well know, a 4th of July parade every year. The fire, took, the fire department took it over probably, uh, I don't know, 12, 14 years ago, something like that, and uh, it's been going ever since, and it's been very, I think, very, very successful. It, it's helped the, our community, and it's basically, we have a lot of people from a lot of places coming every year uh, for our annual Fourth of July parade. And everyone looks forward to that, I'm sure. I know. Um, I think that's about all the questions I have for you, Leo, and I certainly appreciate all the interesting things you said about our town. 
we both realize that our town is becoming a beautiful resort in the summertime with all the yachts, right? That's right. Our marinas are doing a fantastic job and here. Tremendous building that's going on yeah. in the southern part of the town. So there's a lot of hope for Rouse's Point, and we're both very, very proud of it. And I want to. And of course, I want to thank the Champlain New Channels for giving us the opportunity to bring this program to, our, to your home. And of course, we would like to, if you'd like to be on the show and help, and help us remember more things, we'd be glad to join us. Please contact myself, Donna Boyle, or, or, or any members of our Village History Advisory Board. And of course, I we spe especially want to thank uh, Mr. Portugal, Ed Portugal, makes these programs possible. Thank you, Ed. Once again, thank you, and see you again next week. Hello, my name is Joyce Lavoie. I will be your hostess today. Welcome to another segment of the Oral History Project of the Village History Advisory Board. The goal of this program is to invite residents of Ross's Point to share with us their recollection and memories of our village many years ago. I am sure that in this segment we will hear many interesting things about our village. Today we will share some time with Peg Barkham, who is our town of Champlain historian. And this will be the first of a two-part series. Um, welcome, Peg. Thank you. Um, you are a native of Ross's Point. Yes. So, um, and I see you have brought some pictures with you today. Yes. Where would you like to start? Well, I thought I will start with covering State Street and Lower State Street and Montgomery Street today. Uh, rather than jump all over, I thought this would make it more interesting because right. people that haven't lived here doesn't realize all the businesses that used to be here. And of course, State Street was actually Main Street. So many years ago. Many years ago, it was called Main Street because all the everything was down towards the lower end of the, around the Fort Road and so on. It was that's where all the village was. So it. Uh, Yes. So I, the th first things I brought was, this was my newest acquisition, which I'm very proud of. This was given to me by Donald McCollum of Noyan uh, a couple or three weeks ago, and I thought it'd be nice to bring it and show it today. This is another picture of the fort that was taken by Victor Pod which is another one that I like very much mm -hmm. because it's an aerial shot. Now that's all I'm going to show you on the fort because that's another entire program all <laughs> in itself some other time. Uh, now the land just east of the bridge is where Jacques Rouse had his first house. He was granted some land for serving in the revolution and then he wasn't allowed to go back to Canada as most of those men were. So they gave them land and he built his house down there on a point of land and called Island Point. It's between the bridge and the fort. Not, no one knows exactly the exact spot. But he had an inn and he had an orchard and he had a ferry that went over to Vermont. And again, Jacques and himself is another whole program. Right. I have a lot of genealogy on his family and things like that at another time. Now, at the, what we call, of course, that's called the commons. In my time, it's all the land from the lake to the customs to 9B Road was called the commons. And uh, at what we call the gate of the commons is the gate where the road starts, it goes to the fort. Mm -hmm. Well, that's where the Fr Ross's Point's first newspaper was printed. Now, this is the 15th issue of that paper. And if he, I don't know if he can get the date and the it's at the top, the date, it's mm -hmm. 1824. Now, it's not the best of shape, but um, it was given to me, and I was very happy to get it. Mr. McCollum, again, gave me that. It's a nice memento to have. Yes, yes, mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's, it's not in the best of shape, but then in the beach area, what's our beach today, the Rosses Point Rod and Gun Club used to use that for their target practice. Oh, really? Uh, because that wasn't considered a beach then. It was just some of the property. So that's what was there. Um, now, on the, from the bridge road coming west on Montgomery Street, there were four little houses. These four little houses, one is no longer there. They belong to the Colopy family. They also owned the big house, 
which is now an antique shop. That was the Colopy homestead. Um, there was two brothers in that house when the parents died. Neither of them ever married because if they did, they would have lost their inheritance. Oh. This was put in their parents' <laughs> will that they were not allowed to marry. Uh, the big house was then sold later after the Colopies died to a Colonel George Carruthers. Now, George Carruthers was married to Catherine Calbert, that was a movie actress, mm -hmm. when he came around here. His second wife was an artist, and I'm fortunate to have one of her chalk drawings, okay. uh, which I'm very pleased to have. And in one of those little houses of the four that were down there, um, the third one that's still standing, I was born in that house. Then my husband's family lived there, and he was born in that house. And when we got married in 1941, we lived in that house. Well. <laughs> so, so, but Mr. Carruthers was a, 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 belonged to that famous uh, Princess Pat regiment in the Canadian Army. And his father had money because he financed the whole unit. Oh, my. And Mr. Carruthers was very good in the village. He always uh, put on a Christmas party for the children, and he did all these civic things, mm -hmm. which he was very well liked. The house next to that is the Mott House today. Uh, that was used, it was a private home, but the living room was used by traveling clergy, minister or priest, whoever would come to the village, maybe once every six months, someone like mm -hmm. that would come here, and someone would volunteer to let them use their room, their part of their house, and the service would be held there. Oh, so that, that was one of the first ones that was used for that. And in front of that house, on the 11th of June in 1939, a cyclone hit, and it uprooted four big trees that were right across where the sidewalk is today. Mm -hmm. There was four big trees there, like 70 feet tall, and it uprooted the whole four of them. Oh my. So that, that was pretty good, too. Then where Barcombe's Marina is, is the, uh, was the Goodsell Ferry Landing. Um, the ferry ran on a cable. Um, now this, this was quite a thing at that time. A uh, cable was attached to each shore, and the cable would pull the ferry across. Oh, yes. it, that, that would bring the ferry back and forth. Now, Kenny Cooper, George Gebo, and Ralph Paquette were the three that ran that ferry. And on hot summer days, if it was very hot, I can remember my mother putting my sister in a baby carriage, and we'd go down and ride the ferry all afternoon. <laughs> there was no charge, no. If, unless you had a vehicle. So we'd ride the ferry, which, we, you know, at that time was really something that was quite good. Now, I skipped one house, the little house on the corner of Rose Avenue, which is uh, where Thomas... Burke, Burke, Sergeant Thomas mm -hmm. Burke. That was his home. He was the last caretaker of Fort Montgomery from 1915 to 1928. After that, it was abandoned, and everybody went out and took what they wanted. Then the house across from Barcombe's Marina was the Fred Belair house. He lived in the back, and uh, Percy Kinney and his wife ran a little restaurant in the front, oh, a really? little convenience store sort mm -hmm. of thing. And he built, Fred Belair built, a dance pavilion at the, the west side of that house. And it was a long, maybe 40 feet, 20 feet wide. And it had a roof, but no sides, just uh, railing. And on Friday and Saturday night, everybody in the town, the village and everywhere, went down there. And people would volunteer. They'd play violin or play accordion or whatever, and everybody <laughs> danced. And it, it, was, it was great. That was there a few years. And then, of course, that, that disappeared again. Then further up the street is, was the Lovell's Lakeside Press. Now, this is not a good picture, but it's the only picture in existence that I know of at all that anyone has preserved uh, of the Lakeside mm -hmm. Press. And uh, it, um, that was uh, operated from 1874 to, to 1878, and then it eventually burned down. But there again, I have all the dimensions and what went on in that building and the whole thing, which is another complete story. The house next to that, the first brick house, was Walter Phillips, and he worked for Lakeside Press. Um, and he had the first private tennis court in Ross's Point, oh, really? which everyone thought that was a great thing at that time, to have a tennis court of your own. Then the Bullock House, which is where Tom Bathill is today, the Bullocks had a very big poultry business. 
and it was nothing for them to get a check for three thousand dollars and in them days that was lots of money for shipping uh, eggs and chickens and uh, they shipped them by uh, railroad oh. and uh, uh, so there, there is around still some of the uh, waybills and things that, that came from, from that. Then we get to the railroad bridge. Now railroading in Ross's Point, of course, was a big thing at one time. Um, but again, that's a lot to cover today. Mm -hmm. Only to say that there was a teenage boy uh, whose parents lived out on the bridge. And uh, he drowned out there. Um, yeah, and when they found him, he, he was holding on to one of the piers. Oh. Uh, and at 14 years old, he drowned it out there. And uh, another time, a locomotive went into the lake. That must have created so, <laughs> the <laughs> sensation. Uh, it did, and a couple of people uh, drowned in that too. Mm -hmm. But that again, as they say, the railroad is a story in itself. That's right. So, and this is a sort of an interesting picture. This is some of the Hogue family. Uh, Frank Hogue's family, um, in dressed in their best out at the end of the railroad pier. And then, now just, just west of that uh, railroad bridge, between that and the sportsman's, Jacques Rouse had his second house. Now again, we're not exactly sure exactly where, but it had to be between the railroad bridge and the sportsman's. When the government decided to build the fort, they decided they needed their land back. And his land that was given to him was on the commons. So they took his land back. Mm -hmm. So he lived the last years that he was here, he lived between the railroad and the sportsman's dock. That's, that's where he was. Mm -hmm. Now the sportsman's pier, in my generation, that was the depot dock. Right. In 1850, the railroad built a hotel and a customs house um, on that dock. Now, it was the building that ran the whole length of the dock, and it was a train shed. The trains would drive back right in underneath mm -hmm. this shed. But um, the, uh, the smoke and the fumes and the noise from the trains was so bad that it, it didn't flourish as a hotel for I very long. I wouldn't imagine it would. <laughs> and uh, so then, um, the, uh, and that, that, that hotel was called the Station House Hotel. And, of course, the, the dock was Steamboat Dock. But where it changed over to Depot Dock in my time, I don't know. But I never knew it as that. It was always uh, Depot, Depot Dock. Um, then, eventually, um, a tornado. This is another view of the hotel that was at the back of, er, of the uh, train shed that was at the back of the hotel. Um, in a short time later, a tornado hit and it destroyed part of this long building. So then they tore it down and that was the end of that. Mm -hmm. But it, it didn't, uh, for what it was built for, it was never, uh, you know. A success? <laughs> no, no, because uh, without thinking, uh, putting people so near a locomotive right. and the old steam locomotives, of course, were so noisy, you know, and, and the, the smell, so. Um, now across the, the Railroad, of course, the railroad tracks went out on Depot Dock and then came back up mm -hmm. through the village. Well, the tracks on the other side of the road from the Depot Dock, um, in 1933, there was a man found hung. He was a local man, mm -hmm. was found hung in a boxcar out there. And there'd been a carnival here, and it was always thought that some of the carnival men had had something to do with it, but it was a poor family, and they didn't have free mm -hmm. lawyers in those days, so yeah. no one ever did anything about it. So that happened there. And then just west of Sportsman's Pier was our beach. Oh, really? Right in front mm -hmm. of the Bernard House. That was the beach at that time. And uh, we had a lot of good times there. <laughs> now the Merchant House, the Earl Merchant House, was the Lake House. Now this again, this was a very good tourist place. People came, and of course in them days, you know, they, they came and they spent their whole vacations here. They would right. get here and then they'd stay a week or two weeks or whatever. And so the lake house was one of the big attractions at that time. And uh, it was run by people named Jabut. And uh, after the, the uh, people would, this this why they came, they came to fish. Now this was a good day's catch. I guess so. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it was quite successful. And, uh, but this is what they came for. Mm -hmm. They'd come up here to fish. 
uh, most of them. I mean, some would just come to relax, but a majority of them come to fish because it was such good fishing up here. Mm -hmm. So after the Jabuts left out, it was the Joneses that took over the lake house. Mm -hmm. Now the Joneses had a ferry. Uh, this was the ferry when there was a nice windy day and they could use the sail. Oh yeah. So um, of course that they took advantage of all the water power they could get to use the, the ferry boat. And uh, in that picture, there's a delivery cart with two horses being taken across to Vermont. Now this was the ferry with the same ferry, but without the sail, which shows it much better. And my uncle was the rudder man okay. on the end, and uh, he used that rudder to steer it. Mm -hmm. You see, that's how they, they steered to, to get across. And on this one, they've got two of the nice old cars, which uh, somebody seeing this is going to know the vintage, but I don't. <laughs> There was a lot of fancy boats that came to the sportsman's dock also. This was one of them. Look at the beautiful eagle on the top. Uh, now this was a tugboat. Mm -hmm. So all these canal boats that came and went through here, these tugboats pulled them. And it was nothing to see a tug going up the lake with two rows of canal boats side by really? side. Um, they, would, they would use the, and before they had this sort of boat, uh, they had the boats with sails mm -hmm. pulling the canal boats. Well, if there was no wind, they sat That's there until the wind came up again. There was nowhere to go. Now, this, this is the, on the sportsman's pier, see the people that came on these tugs and in the canal boats, they lived right in the canal boats. Mm -hmm. They had their living quarters. Now, this was apparently a get-together of the canal boat people having a little get-together in their fine clothes and their, their canal boats are tied up at Sportsman's Pier. And so that, that was their, but it was, would be nothing to see the canal boats come in and see the ladies' clothesline hanging okay. across the top of the canal boat with her day's wash on it. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it was quite interesting. Of course, these I remember, uh, the tugboats. Um, yes, I, I remember those. Yeah. And this is a, a picture of the Venus Ferry tied up at the Sportsman's. It's a different type of ferry. It's not quite as, uh, as modern. Um, it's a flat thing, and it's, it's really homely, but it probably did its purpose, which is all they wanted. <laughs> you know, it, didn't, uh, it didn't matter that it, was, uh, that it wasn't shaped like the others or whatever. This is one of my favorite pictures. Mrs. James Ber Billy Bernard, Mrs. Marion Bernard, gave this to me. And I, I think this is a fascinating picture. Now, the smaller of these buildings that we can see could be Jacques Rouse's house because mm -hmm. it's in the area and no one is and sure whose sure. house that is. I see. Now, the larger one, Mrs. Bernard told me that that larger house was taken up on Church Street and it's still oh, there, really? that it was moved to Church mm -hmm. Street. It's at the end of the, near the railroad, up at that end up of the at street. That end of the street. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's where that was taken. But, um, now, I think this is one of my real favorite pictures, too. Um, we don't know too much about it, except that we're pretty sure that the uh, further house, the tallest house, is the John Leggett house, where Mrs. Bernard lives today. Lives today. Uh, which Leggetts were there for years and years. I can remember both Mr. and Mrs. Leggett. But it's fascinating because as you keep studying it and trying to figure, where were these buildings and are mm -hmm. any of them still there? Have they been remodeled or are they there? We just can't, can't picture, picture them. them. So it's a quite an interesting picture in, in that, uh, that sense. But uh, it's one of my favorites. This is another one that I like very much. I always thought this was a round barn, but I don't believe it is now. Um, it, this was taken from, if you were standing about at the west line of Delagar property right. and looking uh, out the, that way, um, it, uh, that, that barn apparently was, they, of course, everything was brought in by steamer. Mm -hmm. And apparently when the, everything was brought in, it was put in that barn for storage. It was not a farm barn, as you would think, a right. round farm mm -hmm. barn. It was something like that, but um, it, and then in the back, 
of if you would start at what is the state dock today there was a, a cart path that went around through it to as far as Pearl store mm -hmm. and people would go back there to pick up their coal and their wood and so on for from the stores so it was uh, probably used more like a warehouse like a warehouse yes yes the and then the people would go down there and pick up whatever they had got they'd mm -hmm. go and pick it up in there so that uh, we are watching today the Oral History Project of Village of uh, Ross's Point History Advisory Board and we're visiting with Peg Barcombe who has brought many pictures here starting with Montgomery, uh, Fort Montgomery and following along up to Lower State Street. And Peg, these pictures are fascinating. Uh, you, your home, you said, was down in this area. Yes, yes, the next uh, picture shows it. Oh, well, <laughs> please, <laughs> we'd like to see it. Well, the, uh, the first building, the taller building, is where I was, uh, where my family moved when I was two years old, and it was where Dot Malloy's house is today. Oh, really? It was a two tenement building, um, and the house next to it was Ross's Point's second bowling alley. Oh, really? uh, the first one was Cronkrites on, mm -hmm. on Pratt Street, uh, but this was the second one. And years later, that was turned into two apartments again. Um, and my grandpa lived in the back end in, in one of the apartments. And uh, I can remember the circus used to come in the, the what we call the Rutland lot. And uh, my grandfather had a garden between the Tupski's house and this old bowling alley. And the elephants were just out there, and they got away one day, and they trampled right through the garden and went down to the lake to get a drink of water. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> the, the people in this picture is uh, uh, Vera McCollum Murray and Cora McCollum Brothers. Oh, yes. Uh, this is a picture Vera loaned me. And, uh, <coughs> now, this is a a Navy ship that came in right where Bill Nautel's house is. Mm -hmm. I don't know what kind of a Navy ship, but it was one that could come right up onto the shore. Mm -hmm. And they put a gangplank, and they let the public go up in, and they showed all through. Well, I was old enough to remember when they did this. Um, and uh, everyone went on through. I, I think someone said it was like to uh, raise money for the, the war, war or something. Mm -hmm. And uh, But they had brought that in. And it was quite a sight for Ross's oh, Point to see point, a ship yes. that size here, you know. And uh, now this is a, one of the oil tankers that brought the oil into where Delagars is today. When I was a child, that was standard oil. Right. There was five big tanks there, like there is in Plattsburgh. And uh, the oil would come in, and it would be pumped direct from Sportsman's Pier. There was pipes, and it would be di mm -hmm. pumped direct right up into the tanks. And George Thomas was one of the men that worked for the Standard Oil. And uh, when they filled the tanks, someone had to be on the top to watch when to shut it off. And he would get on the top and kick his feet against the sides of these empty tanks, and you'd hear him all over Ross's Point, and he'd <laughs> sing at the top of his lungs, and raining or whatever. He was out there. I um, suppose uh, the kicking on the could tell when, as it was filling up, it, the sound was Well, changing. it probably could, and he kept, kept time with his music, <laughs> you see. But, and uh, other men that worked there was Clarence St. John's and Sterling Bennett. They mm -hmm. were two of the ones that were there the longest uh, in that place. Um, and before the Standard Oil was there, there was a long apartment house there, and uh, there was three apartments. Uh, there was some Giros and some Wheels that lived in two of them at different times. And in one, I can remember my mother telling that there was the first set of triplets born in this area. Oh, really? And she said people came from miles around to see, to think three babies all at once. You know, they, they couldn't believe such a thing. It was so uncommon, <laughs> uncommon you know, that this, this was really something different. So, and then the state dock, of course, that, uh, I don't have pictures of that, but it's, uh, that was, had a wooden railing along the left-hand side of that dock. Uh, we were in a discussion about this just last week that I didn't ever remember a railing. And uh, uh, Mary Obrey on Rose Avenue went and got out her picture album and showed us. Oh. And it, or there was. There was a railing on the left-hand side. I knew um, I was aware of it that. was a great swimming place. Uh, there was iron ladders 
that went down into the water off mm -hmm. the sides of the dock. Why, I don't know. Maybe to get out of a boat or something. Mm -hmm. But uh, they were great if you'd dive off and you could come back up with the ladders. And then, of course, during Prohibition, the, the uh, federal agents would bring the seized liquor and beer down there, and they'd hire men to stand there and break the bottles and let it go into the, the water, the broken glass, <laughs> and so on. But a lot of those bottles slipped in the water, you know, uh, broke fell it. out of their hands. <laughs> so there was a lot of night diving on the state dock. <laughs> but, uh, of course, those things I remember, because I lived right opposite it. So that, that was uh, something there It was interesting. Then there was a boy that drowned out there, about seven years old. His people lived in the front of the house where I lived, and his mother was so afraid of that water that they moved away. Mm -hmm. But he came back down fishing. Oh and he, he drowned. So it, it doesn't matter if you're going to be drowned, you're going to drown. That's right. So. Then this is State Street when it was a dirt street. Now at the left is Elmer Tulip's uh, shop. And next to that is the laundry saloon. Now there was plank sidewalks in that picture. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Now this is, this is a picture of Tom Hoig, who is Frank Hoig's grandfather. He's the one on the porch. Sam LaWare was um, just a neighbor. Now Mr. Hoig had a fight with the village fathers, and he vowed he would never step on village property <laughs> uh, again. And he never did. For 18 years, he never stepped foot on the sidewalk of Ross's Point. Oh and when he went out, they carried him out in his coffin. So he still never <laughs> he did still set never walked foot. On the um, he was a watchmaker, but mm -hmm. he also sold spectacles. Oh, really? And he repaired watches and all. But um, he, he was really stubborn. This, I think, is fascinating. Uh, this picture, the, notice the porch on the house. Now that was... Again, some of the Hoig family, Jenny Hoig, uh, she couldn't see up or down the street because the street was so close to the house. So they built her this little cupola up in the side of the house so she could stand out there and look up at the drugstore or look down <laughs> at the lake. <laughs> she did sewing for a living. Mm -hmm. I remember her well. The yes, other building so is the uh, laundry saloon mm -hmm. before it burned. Will and Alec Laundry had a saloon there. That is where the apartment house is now? That's where the apartment house is now, yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, now the McCollum house, uh, where, where that, that Tom Hoy, he was born in 1848. Oh. And that, which in this, the, in this, that home? Yeah, where the jewelry mm -hmm. place is mm -hmm. now. That's No, he wasn't born there. Oh, I he see. moved here, mm -hmm. that house, in 1905. I see. But he was also a justice of the peace for 35 years. Um, and he but, was quite active locally. Yes, yes, mm -hmm. yes. Um, now this one uh, was Elmer Tulip's feed store. No, it's not his feed store. This is his him, uh, and he's with another one of the Loares. But this was his delivery truck. Oh, really? He had a feed mm -hmm. store, and this is what he delivered his his feed with. Was in that truck. Okay. So just five minutes. Okay. Um, this now was uh, the city market, which was Pete Blair's. Uh, that that was a that that was a, a run by Pete Blair, and it was where James Bernard is today. Right. That was his mm -hmm. house. This is some of the clerks that were in that store. It's uh, Adrian Obrey, Tony Blair, and Loretta Pilger. Oh, really? And it, yeah, they they were there for a good many years mm -hmm. in the store. This, we believe, may be a Mr. Myers. This was where F.W. Myers first started their brokerage on State Street in 1860. Oh, really? Now, that building is gone. A few years back, Harold Laundrie and mm -hmm. Cy Bernard took it down, but it was right next to the city market. And then there was a big fire, uh, the laundry block, where you say today the mm -hmm. block is. Uh, that burned in 1908 and it was a real big fire. It took out uh, so many places. Uh, it took out the saloon and it took out um, which where they bottled Pap's Blue Ribbon beer in oh, the really? cellar, by the way. Mm -hmm. uh, it took out a movie theater upstairs, um, a Mrs. Martin's restaurant, 
a harness shop, Joe Brothers Furniture Store, and an undertaking parlor. So that brings us up pretty well to what, what we can show today anyway. And uh, if we can continue this, and there's a lot left on State Street. <laughs> thank you very much, Peg. I'd also like to thank Champlain News Channels for giving us this opportunity to bring the program to your homes. If you would like to be on the show, or if you know anyone who would be interested, please contact Mrs. Donna Boyle or any member of the Village History Advisory Board. Once again, thank you and see you next week. Thank you again, Peg. Thank you. It's very interesting. <laughs>